and Matteo Rinaldi is my colleague uh, at Northeastern. He is the director of the Northeastern Smart Center and the director of Northeastern's Costas Nanotechnology Laboratory. Um, he's won uh, numerous awards, including the DARPA Young Faculty Award, the NSF Career Award, and many others. Um, and I think that all of you who are interested in uh, IoT devices, MEMS devices, uh, sensors and RF technology will be really interested to see uh, Matteo's presentation today. So I'm gonna hand it over to Matteo. So thank you very much, Dave. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. And uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. I consider BISAC the most impactful uh, uh, university research center in the broad area of, of microsystems. And uh, certainly it has been uh, an inspiring model for me and my colleagues at Northeastern while we built the smart center. And now that uh, we are expanding the, the center into a university institute with a hub in Oakland, as Dave mentioned, uh, we are really very excited uh, about the potential opportunities to collaborate and create partnerships with uh, uh, BSAC faculties and researchers. So this is, uh, this is very exciting. So today I'm gonna talk about um, two examples of research projects developed in, uh, in my lab that uh, beyond the you know, conventional academic outcomes, uh, I believe they start having some actual impacts on, uh, uh, on real world applications. Uh, so the first one is gonna be about uh, uh, a near zero power uh, uh, infrared uh, sensor and uh, that is, was developed under a DARPA program originally in my group and now is being commercialized by a startup company. Uh, um, and then the second one, I'll talk about some recent work that we did in the area of radio frequency uh, resonators and filters for emerging uh, 6G communication standard. So let me get into that right away. Um, so, okay, let me put the pointer here. So uh, when we talk about the Internet of Things, we really talk about the deployment and maintenance of a very large number of wireless sensor nodes. And often these uh, wireless sensor nodes are deployed in environments that are challenging, environments where power uh, might not be available, where energy harvesting might not also be available. So in these scenarios, energy is really one of the key challenges. And let me try to quantify a little bit this energy challenge. So probably many of you have seen this chart uh, that shows how the industry is predicting a trillion total devices deployed in the environment by 2035. Now, if you think that each of these devices would have a battery lifetime of about three years, which is a pretty long battery lifetime, if you think about it, that would still result in close, close to a billion battery changes per day. So that clearly not, is not something sustainable, right? So now just you know, to, to play with some numbers here is that if you were to extend the battery lifetime of these sensors up to 10 years or so, well, you would be saving roughly under $60 billion per day in battery replacement cost, and you would be saving roughly 80 tons per day in CO2 emissions. So that's definitely some significant impact uh, that can come from there. So what is the energy bottleneck in conventional environmental sensors? Well, really, the main problem is that state-of-the-art sensors drain power from the battery continuously while nothing relevant is actually happening. And only a tiny fraction of the battery energy is used to perform a useful functionality when a target of interest is actually present. So because of this waste of energy when the sensor is standby, the battery lifetime is, uh, is limited. So here, the idea we are proposing is really to replace that conventional active front-end sensing element with a passive event-driven zero-power sensor front-end that, ca that can continuously monitor the environment looking for specific signatures associated with a, an event of interest. And then it's capable of using the energy that contained in that signature to actually create a, an electrical connection between a battery and a backend response device that could be different things depending on, on the deployment scenarios. So in that way, we can eliminate uh, that waste of energy while the sensor is standby and extend the battery lifetime. So this is sort of, you know, um, the, the idea that has inspired the research uh, in my lab in the past few years. And we built different kinds of zero power uh, sensor front end, right? So we work in the RF domain. So these are an RF radio frequency wake up receivers. So here basically we use the high quality factor piezoelectric, piezoelectric on chip transformers combined with very low power CMOS circuit to build this sort of radio receiver that would, that would consume very little power in standby like less than 10 nanowatts, but would be able to turn on uh, when uh, is exposed to a very specific wave um, uh, waveform of radio frequency. 
So we also did similar work in the acoustic domain. So we use this piezoelectric micromachine ultrasonic transducers combined with uh, uh, kind of MEM switches to build sort of an acoustic wake up receivers. We also build uh, these uh, kind of uh, micro, micro cantilevers um, that use uh, you know, chemical sensitive layer. And basically the cantilever would, would turn on and close a pair of contact when it's exposed to a certain concentration of volatile organic chemical. And last but not least, we developed this uh, infrared uh, plasmonically enhanced switch, which basically it's, it's a micromechanical switch that, is, that turns on when it's exposed to very specific wavelength of infrared radiations. And that's what, I, what I'm going to talk about uh, today. So here, the idea is really to, comp to combine sensing signal processing and comparator functionalities in a, in a passive microsystem that is capable of detecting and discriminating unique infrared signatures that are associated with different uh, potential targets of interest. And can do that without draining battery power in standby. So examples of targets of interest could be the heat that is emitted by a human body. It could be uh, you know, the radiation coming from a forest fire or from the heated molecules that contain the exhaust plume of a car. Right? So these are just a few examples of that. So now, how can we sense infrared power? So how can we sense infrared without using power in standby? So here is a, a very simplified um, uh, cartoon that describes how this device actually works, right? So the basic idea is that we use a micromechanical bimorph cantilever. So it's a cantilever made out of two materials with two different uh, uh, thermal coefficients of expansion. So basically, when the cantilever heats up, it bends down, right? So now one end of this cantilever is connected to the substrate through a thermal insulating link, while the other end of the, uh, end of the cantilever carries you know, a contact tip. Now, on the top surface of this cantilever, we're also integrating these metamaterial infrared absorber. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But basically, the idea is that we want to have a very thin structure, so you know, in the order of a few hundred nanometers, that can very efficiently absorb radiation in the mid or the long infrared uh, range. Right? So I'll talk a little bit how we do that. So the, the basic idea is that now, if you take this device um, and we expose to the infrared radiation that matches the absorption wavelength that is defined lithographically in this absorber, well, the energy will be uh, absorbed by the device. And well, the temperature of this micromechanical cantilever will increase, and that will cause a downward downward bending of the uh, uh, of the cantilever, and therefore a vertical displacement of this contact tip. Now, this sounds extremely simple, uh, but was not really done before because it's actually really hard to make something like this work without being uh, uh, affected by things like ambient temperature variation, residual stress, and et cetera, and while being so sensitive to small amount of infrared energy. So to solve these problems, we came up with this, you know, a little bit more um, a sophisticated design uh, for, for the structure. And let me talk briefly about it. So as you can see here, we actually have two cantilevers facing each other. Each cantilever is formed by a head and an inner pair of thermally sensitive legs but also there is an outer pair of thermally sensitive legs. And uh, these two legs are separated by this uh, thermally insulating uh, link, right? Now the head of the cantilever that carries the contact tip also has an integrated plasmonic absorber. And I'll talk more about that later, but you can see here is basically it's a metal insulator metal structure, a few hundred nanometer thick in which we pattern the top metal layer in a way that we can selectively absorb specific wavelengths of infrared radiation. On the opposite head, instead, we have basically a reflector. And I'll tell you that th there are also other configurations I will discuss later. So basically, now the work in principle is that when the, the device is expo exposed to infrared radiation that matches the wavelength defined by that absorber, the radiation is absorbed by the head. And the, the temperature of this structure increases up to these thermal insulating re uh, regions. Right. So therefore, the, since the temperature of this inner pair of thermally sensitive legs increases, that causes downward, downward bending and vertical displacement of the contact tip. So the device is very sensitive to impinging infrared radiation in that uh, wavelength or in that band of interest. Now, on the other side, the device is pretty much immune from all the common mode uh, inputs that, that we might have in there. It could be, for example, ambient temperature variation or residual stress in the thin film materials that we use to build uh, uh, this structure. So as you can see here, for example, if you have an ambient temperature variation, 
both the inner and the outer uh, legs of the structure will bend in the same direction. And that will basically translate in a, a near zero displacement of the, you know, uh, of the relative displacement of the two heads. So there is no modulation of that contact yet. So um, I'm not gonna go into the, all the details in the interest of time of, of the fabrication process, but here is just to show you that um, it's a relatively standard MEMS fabrication process. Um, you know, we developed these uh, at uh, the university, at Northeastern University in our clear room um, uh, using four inch wafers. And now I'll talk more later about this, but now the process is being transferred uh, to uh, a commercial MEMS foundry on a 200 millimeter uh, wafer. Um, only few things that, you know, we kind of did interesting um, in terms of processing here is that instead of using a conventional planner design tip, and we will see this in all the papers that we published from, from my group, we use this sort of ball shaped design. Uh, that was a pretty much a way for us to uh, to build a stiff enough tip uh, for the structure without uh, uh, going through a more complex fabrication process. So it's a very con well controlled lift off process of a platinum layer. Um, that will al allows us to build this, uh, you know, pretty stiff tip using a relatively thin metal layer. So that's one of the tricks we used. You know, certainly in commercial foundries, there are other ways to build uh, tips, as as you might know. Um, so here is an SEM picture of one of the first devices that uh, that that we fabricated. And uh, let me highlight some of the important features here that I described before. So first of all, you can see that because of residual stress in the in the thin film materials. By the way, I didn't mention the materials is silicon oxide and aluminum. So that's the the the, um, the bimorph cantilever structure. So as you can see, there is some level of uh, uh, bending uh, post release of the structure. But as we discussed before, because of you know this sort of in situ compensation mechanism that we have in the structure. There is, no, there is a near zero uh, vertical displacement of the contact tip. So basically we can maintain a gap of 500 nanometers that was basically designed by uh, by process really with the, with the sacrificial layer there. Um, other interesting thing I wanna point out, okay, is this ball shaped tip that I discussed before. Also, uh, you know, here you see these uh, plasmonic structures that are part of that plasmonic absorber. Uh, we, we certainly put quite a bit of effort in uh, making sure, um, you know, the, the overall fabrication process for this structure would, would give very smooth edges for those plasmonic structures, because it turns out that uh, if you don't do that because of scattering, it would be really hard to get very sharp absorption features that in some applications are, are actually uh, uh, very beneficial. Also here, I'm, I'm reporting some uh, important performance metrics of these switches. Uh, so first of all, you know, we say that the zero standby power, because basically in the open state, it's, it's, it's an open mechanical switch, right? So there is an extremely small leakage current. You know, we, we measured less than five femtoamp up to 20 volts bias applied. Uh, so substantially, it's really a zero leakage, uh, near zero leakage there. Um, there is a very large on-off conductance ratio, larger than 10 to the 12. So that means that this is a, it's a switch uh, with a very steep subthreshold slope, right? It's very different from more conventional solid state uh, devices. Uh, the, the amount of infrared power that needs to be absorbed to actually make a contact is in the order of tens of nanowatts. So this probably doesn't tell you much, but just to give you an idea, uh, the, the radiation that is emitted by human body at a distance of maybe let's say five meters from uh, from the switch is in the order of tens of nanometers. Right? So you know you need to be able to have that kind of sensitivity if you want to detect. Uh, you know, for example, human body is one of the targets you want to detect. Uh, we tested the reliability of these switches. We measured uh, over half a million consecutive cycles without failure. Uh, so we don't know when. The, what's the failure mechanism and how many cycles uh, they can survive. We kind of, you know, while we developed that project under the DARPA program, we kind of stopped at that point because that was already sufficient for the applications that we had in mind. Remember, these are switches that are not meant to switch all the time, right? You know, they, they, they are supposed to detect events that are time critical, but relatively rare, right? So, you know, half a million cycle, if you do all the calculation, would already be longer than the self-discharge of the battery that you're using there, right? So, so that's, but certainly from a more fundamental standpoint, certainly be interested in, in learning more about failure mechanism, et cetera, of this structure. Um, in terms of spectral range, we demonstrated absorbers, uh, these sort of plasmonic structures uh, covering 
60, you know, 3 to 60 micron range, so uh, mid to long wave infrared range. So now let me talk a little bit more about these uh, plasmonic absorbers. As I mentioned, I think this is really one of the key features of, 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 of these technologies uh, and also the, inter the intellectual property that came with it, right? Um, so this kind of metamaterial plasmonic absorbers, we did not invent them. You know, there, there were several uh, you know, reports in literature of this kind of metal insulated metal structure. Some people call them perfect absorbers or something like that. But one thing that uh, we really put some effort into was uh, First of all, you know, integrating this structure in a functional, you know, uh, micro mechanical thermal detector. But also, uh, it, you know, when we started the DARPA program, the goal was really to detect these extremely sharp emission lines that come from the exhaust plume of a car. Right. So that was sort of the uh, the, the, the the case that DARPA wanted us to uh, uh, to focus on. Right. And so, you know, basically. In order to be selective, you want to have absorption fissures that are, you know, uh, they have very high, high absorption, you know, close to 100% if possible, but extremely sharp. So we put a lot of effort in trying to come up with models. You see here, there is an equivalent circuit of models that we uh, developed for these kind of structures that not only, you know, can be used to predict the absorption wavelength. Right, but can also be used to uh, uh, basically predict the the bandwidth of that absorption feature or the full width of maximum of these uh, uh, of these absorption peaks. And so it turns out that not only the shape is important. I mean, for a given material set, clearly not only the shape of this plasmonic structure is important, but also how far we put them from each other. Right, that also plays an, an important role in setting the full width of maximum. And here you can see some of experimental data that we have here. So we build on the same chip, uh, multiple absorbers targeting different wavelengths. And you can see that uh, you know, by changing the uh, lateral dimensions of this cross, in this case, we can change the uh, absorption wavelength while maintaining a full width of maximum that is less than 4% or so. So that's definitely was one uh, important accomplishment uh, for, for this project. Now, so why did, oh, please, we have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that yes that's how we started the program oh so the the question is if the idea is to basically take the energy out of, of the exhaust plume of a car yes that's the, the idea basically we wanted to be able to detect the presence of a car from the exhaust plume of the car itself and you know basically we wanted to use that energy to trigger the active right. electronics but we don't want to that's that's, yeah. that's correct yeah yeah um so why is it interesting, it's so important to have this spectral selectivity, right? Because now if you think about it, you can build some sort of zero power infrared spectrometer. I mean, it's not really a spectrometer, it's more a you know, signature, infrared signature detector, right? I mean, of course you will never have a, you know, a very high spectral resolution and, and an actual spectrometer. But, you know, basically the idea is that now you can build multiple switches on the same chip and each switch can have its own absorption wavelength, basically. And so you can connect these switches in a sort of a logic circuit that would turn on. In other words, will connect the battery to whatever is the load uh, uh, whenever a very specific combination of wavelengths is actually present. And, and here you see an example we did uh, in the past. So we built four different devices with four different absorption wavelengths. And, and you can see that each device turns on only when it's exposed to the uh, wavelength it was designed to, to detect. And also in this particular case, all the switches turn on when they are exposed to a broadband uh, emission, right? So now this could be a good thing, but it could also be a bad thing, right? And there might be cases in which you wanna reject broadband radiation. So you wanna be able to detect specific signatures, but you don't want your device to be triggered by any broadband uh, uh, emission coming from a hot object. So there are different ways to address that challenge. Uh, here, I'm giving you a quick example. Let, let's say, for example, we want to detect uh, the emission spectrum of a flame, right, that I'm showing here in red. But on the other, uh, uh, simultaneously, we want to be able to reject uh, an exhaust plume of a car, the emission that come from an exhaust plume of a car, or the emission from a hot, you know, black body, right? So a way to do that is that basically we can uh, use the other head of the cantilever uh, to create sort of a, a wavelength that we want to reject. Right? So in other words, we, we, det we pattern an absorber that uh, matches the wavelength we want to detect and target wavelength on the head that carries the contact tip. 
On the opposite head, we design an absorber that targets the wavelength that we want to reject. And as you can see clearly, right, if the device is exposed only to the wavelength we want to detect, there is a, a relative displacement uh, of the two heads, and therefore, you know, we can modulate that gap. But if both wavelengths are present, both cantilevers bend in the same direction, and therefore, uh, uh, there is no change in the in the in the gap. And so we we build this kind of structure, and here you see the experimental data. Uh, where basically here you can see that uh, the device uh, turns on only when it's exposed to the target wavelength and it does not turn on when it's exposed to the wavelength we want to reject or a broadband radiation that includes both wavelengths. And here you see actual, you know, the the gap uh, uh, that separates the, the, the two contacts. You can see that basically that goes to zero uh, only when uh, the device is exposed to the target wavelength. So another interesting thing I wanna I wanna mention um, is that many of you that worked on MEM switches uh, before um, or studied MEM switches probably are aware of the issues of uh, addition forces at the contacts, right? So that's uh, it's a big challenge. And when we started that project, uh, we thought that was probably gonna be how our toughest thing to overcome, right? In other words, you know, we wanna make switches that are relatively soft, right? So they, they are very sensitive. But then upon detection, right, there is a risk that restoring force is not large enough uh, compared to the addition force that we have at the context. So actually, we knew that when we started the program, and that's why we use a platinum contact, right? Because, you know, we've been studied before, platinum is a good material for low addition forces. And in fact, I think we, we measured, you know, addition forces in our contact that are in the range of 10 nanonewton, which is pretty low. But we quickly realized that it actually was not such a big deal, actually. So if we could design switches that latch on upon detection, well, the only thing we need to do is to find a way to reset uh, the switch upon detection, right? Remember, these are very rare events, right? So it's okay if we spend a little bit of energy, right, to reset the switch uh, uh, upon detection. And so when we realized that, well, basically what we did, we integrated a, a, a microheater in the other head of the cantilever, with the, the one that doesn't have the contact tip. And clearly, you know, what, what, what happens in this case that even if the device latches on upon um, uh, detection, well, then we can uh, apply a tiny pulse of energy for a very short inter uh, interval of time uh, to actually uh, reset uh, the, the, the switch. So we have that. Uh, uh, so first of all, we have a device that has some sort of, you know, memory function, right? There is a, an hysteresis there. And we have these reset capabilities that it's very important for some uh, applications. Now, in terms of applications, I think there are many, really many, many applications where these technologies could be applied that, that they, they really span the entire electromagnetic spectrum, right? Going from short wavelength infrared radiation, the optical communication, flame detection, certainly human presence detection, uh, but also maybe moving forward, also terahertz and communications and things like that. Uh, but uh, certainly now we have been focusing on uh, human presence detection because we think we found an interesting product uh, problem um, in consumer products that can be addressed by this technology. And that's why we spun out this company, Zepsource Technologies, that is now commercializing this, uh, 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 this switch. And, you know, the problem is that, uh, as, you, as you know, uh, human presence detection is uh, integrated in many consumer products kind of devices, you see examples here in this chart. But all of these are characterized by a very short battery lifetime, typically way less than a year. But also uh, they are often non-responsive. Uh, you know, false negative is a clear example. Probably it happened to many of you, right? That you are uh, in your office sitting at the desk and then the lights turn off because your motion sensor uh, detects that you're stated, that doesn't detect motion, right? So th those kind of false negatives are very often uh, uh, reported in this kind of, uh, of devices. So basically, we think we have a kind of a, an interesting solutions, right, uh, to, to address these problems, you know, in terms of battery lifetime and also in terms of uh, those false negatives, right, because our sensor is not triggered by motion, but is actually triggered by actual uh, heat that is emitted by human bodies. And, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, just, just to show that uh, these are interesting markets, right? They're, uh, they're, pretty relatively large markets. We are talking here about the IoT motion sensor, proximity sensor, and occupancy sensors. They're all pretty sizable markets in the four, a few billion dollars range. And they're also fast growing here. Yeah, you can see the an example of the IoT motion sensor market. So there is inter definitely an interesting uh, opportunity there. But it's also interesting to note that um, depending on the specific customers in these market segments, 
So typically these markets can be addressed either you know, by selling a sensor component. So it just basically sort of package MEM switch uh, with minimal electronic, but there are also interesting opportunity to, uh, to sell sensor modules, right? So basically it would be the MEMS, package MEMS component with some electronics around that would provide uh, the required functionality. So that's certainly uh, an interesting uh, thing. And uh, so what we did at the university that I think uh, was extremely useful for us, we did uh, this National Science Foundation i program uh, that basically, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amount, it's some, some funding that allow that allowed us to uh, interview over 150 potential customers and to basically validate the value proposition of these switches for those application areas that I described before. And here you see it's a very crowded slide. I mean, it's not meant to be read, but, you know, just to give you an idea that we really, you know, talk with many people. And we not only validated... Uh, the value proposition in terms of extended battery lifetime, uh, but also, as I mentioned before, in terms of reduced uh, false negatives and false positives, right? Uh, and also in terms of miniaturization. So what we found out that many, many of these applications, people don't want bulky devices and in particular bulky lenses. And so some of the low power and cheaper solutions like PIR sensors, they require a Fresnel lens in front, right? So we do not need that uh, uh, to operate these devices. So that's another uh, part of our value proposition. So basically, the the product that we are trying to introduce into the market is this uh, infrared sensor module that would have uh, the highest level of performance in terms of accuracy, range, and field of view. Right? Again, we're not using a lens compared to you know, state-of-the-art infrared detector, but we'll, we'll achieve that with the lowest possible system penalty in terms of cost, power, and, and size. So it's really uh, occupying a, a, an interesting white space uh, uh, there. So as I mentioned before, Zepsur, the startup company, is a, is a fabless company, and now uh, these switches have been fabricated by a commercial MEMS foundry using the, on, on 200 millimeter wafer using a wafer level packaging solutions. So we don't have uh, foundry samples yet, but I want to show you just some quick videos that show the um, uh, some of the early devices that we built. So here you can see they are packaged in a pretty conventional vacuum ceramic package with an infrared transparent window. So this is a big package. So inside that package there are you know hundreds of, of switches. But you know this gives you an idea of how this thing works. So in this case you see the device is connected to a multimeter. It's powered with 2.7 volts. So quite uh, kinds of doesn't drain any current right in standby but when um, the end of the users uh, is at the detection range that the device basically turns on and switch on um, here it's another video that shows that actually the device powered by a coin cell battery again does not drain any current from the battery when in standby and in this case it is also connected to a cots um, LoRa transmitter, and you can see here a, a, a LoRa receiver is connected to, to, to this computer. And in this case, you see when the hand is at the detection range, basically the transmitter is triggered and the signal is uh, received here uh, by, by the receiver. So basically this is just to show that we can actually drive, uh, you know, COTS um, response device, like the transmitter radius and et cetera. And here is just an example, another example that shows that this can be used also to detect a person passing by uh, walking uh, a distance of about four to five meters to the to the switch. Okay, so now with that, let me um, uh, switch gears a little bit and let me talk about some other exciting uh, work that uh, we have been doing in the the last year or so in the area of radio frequency microacoustic resonators and filters for uh, uh, next generation wireless communication uh, standards. So, and before going there, let me talk a little bit about the landscape of frequency allocation and uh, corresponding filter technologies uh, nowadays. Now, if you think about the, the 3GPP standards, right, uh, you know, 4G uh, is certainly, you know, something that has been there for a while. So we're talking the range 0.7 to 0.6 gigahertz or so. Uh, and in the last few years, uh, the 5G, uh, as you well know, was, uh, was deployed. And 5G has actually two bands, right? So there is the uh, sub six gigahertz band uh, that has been mass deployed. Uh, it's really more a reframing of 4G LTE. So there is not a significant improvement in data rate compared to, uh, to 4G, uh, but certainly this has been mass deployed. Certainly there is the, also the 5G millimeter wave uh, uh, that really would exploit the whole potential of 5G in terms of data rate. Uh, but uh, it has you know drawback of very limited coverage, right? And in fact, is not uh, the deployment is still uh, quite limited. 
And when we talk about uh, uh, you know uh, filters and uh, crowd electromagnetic spectrum, we should also consider Wi-Fi that pretty much is now uh, everywhere. Now, if you look at filter technologies uh, that can be used to address these uh, uh, communication standards, we have you know things like ceramic filters, and those are you know they really work in a very wide range of frequencies, but they're not really miniaturized solutions, especially you know in, the, in these frequencies. So they're not really things that we can have in cell phones or things like that. Um, so um, in uh, mobile platforms, for example, microacoustic devices like surface acoustic waves uh, have been widely used, and particularly surface acoustic wave microacoustic resonators filters have been dominant for you know the low frequency end of, of the spectrum. And now with new kind of high performance so devices, um, now they are pushing also in the you know 4G uh, kind of uh, uh, fre uh, frequency bands. Uh, for higher frequency bands, you know, talking 4G and sub, uh, sub CD gigahertz 5G, we have the aluminum nitride bulk acoustic wave uh, technologies, you know, F-bar technologies. Those are really mainstream technologies, dominant technologies for, you know, 4G and 5G in mobile uh, uh, platforms. So uh, these uh, technologies have been, you know, very successful in covering uh, these existing bands, but there is now uh, an interesting uh, new uh you know, standard that is coming up, the 6G, you probably have heard about it. And so there are three main bands that have been proposed in the in the 6G. So there is the, uh, what is called the wide area coverage band. Uh, so that's less than 0.7 gigahertz. So this is all kind of IoT, uh, you know, kind of application. So low frequency, low data rate, uh, uh, but so that's certainly that's there. Uh, there is the sub terahertz, uh, uh, you know, 6G band. So that would be, the extremely high data rate, but also with extremely low coverage. So that would, would be a sort of a limited uh, use case. And then there is this uh, 6G mid band, people called also 5G IFR3, uh, that you know many people think would be probably the main use band in next generation mobile devices. And that is because it really has an excellent uh, uh, trade-off between uh, network capacity and, and coverage, right? So it's, we are at that frequency range that uh, we have a, a good trade-off. Now, as you can see from this chart, uh, there is not really any filter technology. Well, I would say this ceramic filters could address that, but not in a miniaturized fashion. fashion. But if you talk about microacoustic filter solutions, there is really nothing available that can work um, in that uh, frequency range. So there is definitely a need to develop a new generation of bulk acoustic wave uh, microacoustic filters that can uh, address the needs of these um, incoming new bands. And in the, in the next, uh, Five to ten minutes. I'll try to discuss briefly, uh, uh, you know, about the, the, the technology, the cross-sectional memory mode resonator technology we developed uh, for for these reasons. Uh, so when we talk about RF filters uh, and, and microacoustic resonator, the idea is that really microacoustic resonator can achieve high Q in a very small form factor that is not achievable with other kind of filter technologies. And really, there are very important resonator parameters like the electromechanical coupling coefficient and the quality factor that set all the filter performance in like bandwidth, skirt steepness of the filter pass band, and of course the insertion loss. And you know, F bar was is the mainstream solution compared to surface acoustic wave devices because can achieve higher Q and higher KB square uh, than those devices. So one challenge that F-bar devices have is that the operating frequencies of this structure is set by the thickness of the piezoelectric material that is used to build this, the device. So basically, you cannot lithographically define multiple frequencies on the same chip. So in the same aluminum nitride material, right? for example, you could define these uh, lamp wave resonators or contour mode resonators that are lithographically defined by the lateral dimensions of the structure. So that's a big advantage, but as you can see, the coupling coefficient that you achieve, so the KT square, right, it's much smaller than what is achievable with F5. So we developed this cross-sectional and main mode resonator technology that basically sort of combines these two, uh, the advantages of these two technologies. Basically, we are assigned a la main mode, or a, which is a mode of vibration that's two-dimensional mode uh, um, displacement vector in the cross-section of, of an aluminum nitride uh, piezoelectric beam film. So these achieve uses both piezoelectric coupling coefficients, so achieve coupling coefficients that is comparable with F-bar, but also has some sort of lithographic tuning capability, which is very important, especially scaling at high frequencies. Now, if we look at the requirements of these new bands that we discussed, the low spectrum and, uh, and, and, and the mid spectrum 6G, well, you see that, you know, for the low spectrum, we really need 
KT squared larger than 5% and a Q larger than 2000. And you know, in this case, you cannot really use a thickness mode, um, right? Because to go that low in frequency, you will have to use very thick piezoelectric layers that is not uh, sustainable from a manufacturing standpoint. Uh, and when you scale at high frequency, well, you know, you would want to use maybe a two-dimensional mode of vibration, but you need a KD squared larger than 10% and a Q larger than 1,000. So there is really nothing available uh, uh, that has this performance. And that really required breakthroughs in material uh, properties. So that's one of the things that my group and many other groups in the community have been exploring, like scanium doping of aluminum nitride as a way to increase the coupling coefficients of, uh, of the material. And you can see here, uh, by doping aluminum nitride with scandium, you, you can actually increase the coupling D33 and D31 almost by three, uh, three times, right? And so that's very, very exciting because th that now allows you also to build uh, structures like the, the, the sort of cross-sectional main board resonator that I showed you before, that instead of requiring the top and bottom electrode pattern can be just implemented with a top electrode because the coupling coefficient of the material now is high enough to support that and simplifies dramatically uh, the fabrication process of this structure. So we're talking potentially like a two mask fabrication process to build uh, to build these devices. So, and the, let me very quickly go through some of the material uh, work that we did. So here you see, we used the a Evatec uh, cluster line tool. It's an eight inch uh, cluster line PVD system that we have at Northeastern use a 12 inch uh, casted scandium aluminum nitride target. So this is aluminum um, uh, scandium doping, 30% scandium doping uh, to deposit on 200 millimeter wafers with very high uh, uh, thickness uniformity. As you can see here, we really optimized uh, ma material deposition for thin film materials like 280 nanometers that can be used for those high frequencies that I described before. Um, and uh, so here are some of the results. Uh, that we have. So you see here, there's a micromechanical resonator operating at uh, around 9.5 gigahertz. It shows an electromechanical coupling coefficient of over 7% and a quality factor of about uh, 900, which is uh, uh, really uh, very exciting. And uh, we scale up also at higher frequencies. So here you see at around 19 gigahertz, we get KD square approaching 10% with a Q factor larger than 220. And, uh, and so we really build devices across you know, the whole spectrum, you know, from six to 20 gigas, uh, which is uh, something very exciting. We did that using just two substrates basically, right? So because we have the lithographic tuning capability. Uh, and just to give you an idea of the importance of these results compared to the state of the art, right? What you can see here, some important resonator metrics, right? Like the FQ product uh, uh, plotted uh, versus quality factor. And basically what we want to be here, we wanna be on the top right corner of, of this chart, right? So we want to have high F time Q product, but while we scale frequency up, we want to maintain a high quality factor. And as you can see, uh, you know, we, we are really uh, creating the boundaries of what was achievable before with these uh, relatively simple uh, structures. And same thing for the KT square time Q or the figure of merit of the resonator technology. You want to be on this top right corner of the, of the chart, right? So you want to have high coupling, maintaining high quality factor at this very high frequency. So this is very, very exciting and promising. And here I'm just showing some unpublished results uh, where basically we actually built some initial uh, single chip multi-frequency filters in the seven to 10 uh, or 12 gigahertz band. So these are relatively simple filter structures, uh, you know, so just the first order and so forth, uh, but definitely show that you can achieve the bandwidth and the insertion loss that will be required by this uh, wireless communication standard. And this is just a simulated result uh, that shows what we would be able to achieve with those you know, 20 gigahertz devices that, uh, that we recently built. They have a quality factor of slightly over 200, a KT square of 10%. And you can see here, you can get filters of fractional bandwidth of 4% and insertion loss of 2.2. So this is uh, very exciting uh, as it, it's really uh, creating an opportunity for, uh, for these frequency bands. And uh, this is just the last slide showing that uh, we're also exploring how to scale up in the millimeter wave. Uh, so we have been doing that with aluminum nitride now. So these are you know, pretty sort of preliminary results and we don't have time to talk, but we use several design tricks in this structure, right? To avoid, you know, bending of, the, of this 
piezoelectric plates and so forth. We have reflectors at the edge and et cetera. But what is, I think it's really exciting here is that for the first time we see devices operating uh, you know, over 20 years with a quality, quality factor that is larger than 500. And you know, I've been working in this field for many years and uh, you know, up to you know, a year and a half ago, I thought this was not possible with this material set. So I think this is uh, really exciting and it's opening uh, new venues for research and development uh, in the field. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, the group, uh, all the students, postdoc researchers and collaborators, they of course deserve all the credit uh, for the work that I show. And uh, I'll be I also wanna thank the sponsors of the research. I wanna, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so we'll start with questions in the room, but we're also keeping an eye on questions from chat uh, from the folks who are joining online. Um, so maybe we'll start with if there are questions from anybody inside the room. I got one. Uh, you mentioned uh, the don't need a elbow. Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Why, why do you use an elbow to put it here? Yeah, I, my understand. Oh, the question. So the question is why uh, you don't need a Fresnel lens while conventional PR sensors actually need a Fresnel lens. Well, um, so the my understanding of the uh, PIR detector is that they work on a differential signal. So they basically need the Fresnel lens to create that sort of uh, uh, you know different. How do you call it? Uh, so basically to create that differential uh, yeah. signal coming in, right? Pixels, exactly, pixels, exactly, right. Uh, while we don't have that because we are just working on uh, the radiation that is emitted by the yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. That's a great question. Um, so uh, as I said, I, I, I touched a little bit on those uh, things, right? Uh, there are ways to reject those kind of signals, right, interfering signals. It also has to do a lot on how these sensors are gonna be deployed, right? So if you think about, um, you know, a soap dispenser or something like that, and we're starting with those case scenarios. Closed. Exactly, they are closed. And, you know, if you have a stable background, clearly makes things much easier. Now, I don't wanna say that it's not possible to use these devices in other scenarios, but it's certainly more challenging. It requires a lot more work um, to, to address the challenges that we're talking about. But we are doing that. I mean, Sepsor now, the, the company is working on, you know, depending on the specific case scenarios, trying to quantify and put specific metrics for all the you know, reasonable interfering signals. Is The detection range, so, okay, for, um, let's say, if we, if we want to detect the radiation coming from a human body, so the entire body, uh, and we have some data, actually, that shows that here. Yeah. It's going to be, actually, a human body is probably going to be five meters or so, something like that, without using any lens. I mean, of course, we could use a lens, right? I mean, that, there are, that would extend that range. But basically, with, with the uh, device performance we have now, we are talking about five meters or so. If you're talking about imaging just one hand, uh, that's gonna be the distance of tens of centimeters, right? Because of course there is less, less energy coming I mean, just from a hand. And I think I have a slide uh, where we actually measured these things. Let's see if I can show this. Yeah, so we did some, you know, actual characterization of, you know, energy with this with a, it's a flyer camera, I think it's an infrared camera. Uh, and basically we calculated the energy that would be delivered on the sensor. Um, you know, in different case scenarios, right? If you're imaging a you know, body from the front, from the side, from the head, just one hand. And here you see the actual power level right, that we need to be able to detect. So basically you, you're talking, so the question is, um, uh, what's the maximum dynamic range that you can tolerate in the kind of spectrometer application that I described? Yes. 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 So yeah. So basically, uh, as I mentioned before, we have ways to uh, 
reject a certain signal. But yes, but 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 you're right. But but you know, basically, there will be a limit for which you know those cantilevers will bend, and there will be some you know plastic deformation or something like that that uh, could destroy those. Um, I, I think I, I don't have a number, uh, but you know, I, I would say a challenge that we have also in the current devices, hopefully we'll will not have that in the in the foundry prototypes, is that we are using a xenon diaphoride release for these devices. So the cavity depth it's kind of limited, right? And some of those legs are pretty long. So the, the challenge we have with strong signals, what we're talking as you're talking about, even if it's just temperature prediction, right? We go, I think we went above 250, right? But if you go above that those legs actually touch the bottom of the cavity, and that is a problem. Uh, so yeah, there the are possibly ways to address that, uh, but uh, but basically, yes, there will always be a limit, right? That you can destroy the sensor if you if you send enough energy. So somehow that has to be uh, uh, either outside the specs of the applications or has to be filtered out, right? There should be some sort of additional filters that prevent, uh, you know, strong signals in other limits. Well, I'm talking about like, for example, it could be just uh, in the in the wheel of the package, right? Something that just filters out a portion of the sunlight uh, spectrum, for example. I mean, that might not apply to indoor applications, right? But we have been thinking about also how to extend the use of these devices outdoor and all. Oh, for sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have one question, chat. Yes. Yes. So that's. That's a great question, right? I mean, you know, uh, so I think one of the fundamental, uh, I think, uh, findings, right, that, that we have this work on the, on scandium nitride is really the fact that the old community I mean, clearly knew, right, that we could achieve high coupling doping aluminum nitride and scandium. So that was pretty well known by everybody, right? And there's quite a bit of work. But of course, you know, everybody in the community felt that, you know, while we dope with scandium, the material becomes softer. And we thought that it would be impossible to achieve the same level of quality factor that is achievable with aluminum nitride. So basically what this work shows that that's not true, right? I mean, it, you, we are basically getting F9 Q products that are very comparable you know, what you achieve with pure aluminum nitride, although we are doping with 30% scandium. And I think that it, it's it's really an exciting thing. Now, is this now limited by uh, material? I still think it is, actually. I think the Q can be even higher than this. Um, and, and you can see that, I mean, I, I went very fast here, but, you know, uh, one big problem that we have with uh, uh, scandium doped aluminum nitride is this sort of uh, AOGs or abnormally oriented grains. Uh, but while we deposit the, the material, so basically we have some uh, uh, grains that uh, are not oriented in the in the right direction as we film. So that has been a big problem with scandium doping of aluminum nitride. So with time, right, we were able to address some of this challenge. And you see here we have uh, you know these AOGs are these tiny dots that you see here in this uh, uh, you know AFM scan. So these are very smooth surface, but still there are. Uh, you know, some of these AOGs. So uh, certainly, I think there is marginal improvement by working on material deposition techniques and also material stack, right? So, you know, this material now is deposited directly on silicon, right? You can get much better performance in terms of material properties if you deposit on platinum uh, or other template materials, right? So I think there is a lot of material science that also can still be done to improve uh, further uh, the Q factor of these devices. How far are you from the the F time Q product. So the question is, how far are we from the theoretical limit of the F time Q product? Well, in some of these devices, um, we are getting actually higher than the uh, conventional F time Q product that's produced by aluminum nitride. But because we, well, not if you go in the regime at a higher frequency, right? In the other, I remember how it's called the, yeah, Kieser regime, I think. Yes, right. So if you go above that frequency range, actually shows that. Uh, this, the, the F9Q product start increases, and we are basically close to that for what is predicted. Which is very hard to achieve a lower frequency. So it's higher than what all the work we done, we've done in the past um, at hundreds of megahertz or sub gigahertz did not achieve the F9Q product. No, we are not exceeding prediction. 
Yes. Oh. Yeah, yes, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, um, so the question is about the uh, switching speed or the bit rate that you can achieve with, the, uh, with these switches. So these are still thermal sensors, right? They're very tiny, so low thermal mass, but large thermal resistance. So, you know, you can go, uh, Reasonable. So these device, some of the most sensitive devices that I show you are in the few hundreds of millisecond as a thermal time constant. Okay. Uh, now you can probably push in the tens of millisecond, but I don't think I mean, it, it's a. It will be a trade off be, between detection threshold and speed. But certainly these are not meant to be you know fast. When I talk about optical communication, I'm talking about basically having a trigger, right? You know, basically a. Again, when we talk about the zero power receivers, but it would be triggered by an impinging signal or a combination of frequencies or wavelengths, but certainly it, it won't be a high bit rate communication device. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I have one quick question. Please. So these, the, the filters are so small. Yes. Right? They could, it seems like, like cost effectively put them on like, a, some kind of like a PA chip or something. It could be Right. Yes. CMOS or other technologies. It seems like there's not really so much interest in doing that. It's that's how the filter chips are so Yes. Okay. So the question is about uh, so the the RF filters we are building are very small, so they could potentially be integrated on several electronic platforms. But why this is not happening? Why right? nobody's doing that? Right. Um, so I think I think when we are talking about this higher frequency range, I think there are applications, and I'm talking about you know very high performance application like DoD. You know we are working under DARPA Coffee program. Um, uh, we are collaborating with Radeon, and they, for example, are very excited about the idea of putting these on a gallium nitride uh, you know, process, for example, right? So I think um, there are interesting opportunities there. Um, I guess for, for the consumer world, I guess it all depends on the cost, right? Uh, you know, I think it's a very cost-sensitive market. That's what I, I would think. And uh, unless there is a, an impelling need in terms of performance that cannot be achieved with integration. I think that's to answer your question, why that didn't happen. It's probably because, you know, they work well enough, not integrated and probably cost less. Um, but certainly it's interesting to see what will happen. Uh, higher frequencies, what kind of architectures we could, you know, come up with given these new filter technologies. Yeah. That's the... Absolutely, yeah. Well, certainly there are things like, uh, you know, we thought about applications in the uh, mechanical computing, right? It's kind of crazy stuff. You know, we really need millions of these devices, but uh, having them at operating at 20 gigahertz rather than uh, 20 kilohertz, you know, maybe instead of going for many millions, you need thousands. I don't know. I'm just throwing numbers. Don't quote me on that. But, but we did a little bit of that uh, analysis and there are interesting application that's still very, very challenging, but yeah. I think I, I guess it doesn't just drop a quick program it's quantum inspired. Yeah. In exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we did propose to, yeah, we did propose to one of those the knapsack program, I think was called from that year. So and uh, we were invited for full proposal, but then we did not get fun. But it would have been a very tough uh, one to yeah. implement because we would have to build Larger arrays of these uh, 20 gigahertz resonators. Very exciting, but I think, you know, uh, hopefully we'll have found this helping us soon with all this chips act money. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody who joined online.